Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. He is one of the most rightfully celebrated comedians in comedy history. Let's go over a couple of things he's done. Head writer of SCTV. He wrote and starred in Ghostbusters and Stripes. He directed Vacation, Groundhog Day. The list goes on and on. Now to help us get an up-close and personal look at the celebrated man, his daughter, Violet Ramis Steele, has written a beautiful book about her life with him, Ghostbusters' daughter, Life with my dad, Harold Ramis. Please, big round of applause for Violet Ramis Steele. Hey. Hi. Um, Your book is exactly what a book about Harold Ramis feels like it should be, if that makes sense. That's a great compliment. Um, for anybody who's read about him or enjoyed his movies, even in the uh, most raucous and scatological of his work, there is a huge heart. Uh, he was always very good at finding the heart in the material. And uh, everybody that ever worked with him talked about him being that way as well. And your book really comes off that way. Was that important for you to make sure that that came off? Or is that just sort of easy to do because that's how he was? Um, both. I mean, it was, you know, part of my goal in writing the book was to capture as much of him as I could. Um, after he passed away in 2014, um, there was just a huge sort of outpouring of grief and love for him. And, uh, you know, people were feeling this tremendous sense of loss. They wanted more of him. So I felt like, you know, I was in a great position to be able to give that um, and sort of offer, you know, my take on the man that he was. Did this also help you remain, feel like you remained close to him while you were writing it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was thinking about him all the time anyway. So this allowed me to sort of immerse myself in his life and do it in a really creative, productive, positive way. I feel like, uh, or I imagine it would also help you feel like you're kind of in conversation with him. I mean, so much to the point where, you know, you, you close the book out with a, with, with a really nice letter to him. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I hear his voice in my head um, all the time. I mean, he was a wise, insightful man, and he was very generous with his, with his insights. So um, I, I don't have to wonder, you know, what he would say or feel about a certain subject because more than likely he spoke about it at some point and I can, you know, go back and check the records. Yeah, you know, and when it comes to books about celebrities or entertainers, so often they are salacious in, in and of themselves. They're sold on the idea that you're going to learn something dirty and new about this person, and mm -hmm. it's not that at all. It's more like you might learn a fair amount of new stuff, but even the new stuff, it's like this is you're just reading about someone that you really like. Yeah, I mean, our family doesn't really do drama. Yeah. Um, so even things that may be surprising to people, you know, it doesn't come from a sort of gossipy place. It's just telling our story. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good, but um, we were always very open with each other and, you know, just sort of worked through it together. What were you most surprised uh, about finding out about your dad or feeling about your dad in the process of writing this book? Um, I mean, there really weren't any big surprises. Um, I think that he loved talking about himself uh, when he was alive. So I had heard so many of these stories um, and heard him, you know, sort of talk about his um, entry into comedy and his childhood and his philosophies over the years. So it was really just about sort of taking all that and synthesizing it and um, putting it out there. Yeah. And you have uh, you talk about the period of time where he got remarried and you became a sort of stepdaughter and uh, did what most, I think, stepchildren do, which is rebel a little bit and get a little uh, frustrated with the new the new parent in your life. Did you have any trouble writing about that or did you feel weird writing about that at all? Um, I mean, I, I tried to sort of uh, channel my dad and, and be as generous, you know, of spirit as possible. I think, you know, one of the greatest lessons that he taught me was that you know, life is messy and there's ambiguity in everything. So even when people screw up or are not their best selves, they're trying and they're doing their best and hopefully, you know, they'll learn a better way later on. You know, you write uh, about Ghostbusters where you say you had seen it when you were younger, but then you saw it again when you were 15 and you got the jokes more. I had the same experience. You mm -hmm. know, when I was a child, I had the full jumpsuit, I had the pack, I had the trap, I would mm -hmm. run around the neighborhood and I would catch ghosts all day with my friends. But then I watched it again, I think, you know, I think there was a period of time between like maybe 10 and 16 mm -hmm. where I didn't watch it and I watched it when I was 16 and it took on a completely different resonance to me. The jokes landed so much more. Did you have that experience a lot of the time with your, with your dad's films? I did, I mean, I think um, because I was on set with him so much, I mean, he really took me everywhere. Um, 
you know, through Club Paradise, which she made after Ghostbusters, you know, I was sort of disenchanted. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, Caddyshack, Stripes, like, they're good. <laughs> but, eh, I mean, Ghostbusters especially, I was, you know, everyone was so excited about it. I was in third grade when it came out, and, you know, all my friends and classmates would just gather around him when he picked me up from school. And I was like, oh, God. Egon, whatever. Like, <laughs> you hear celebrities say that all the time about parenting. That like, my kids don't care about my stuff. And as someone who didn't have parents that are entertainers, you're like, how could that be possible? Like, I would freak out if my if my dad was Brad Pitt or my dad was Harold Ramis or my dad was some. I don't know why I said Brad Pitt. We're not talking, <laughs> but like, you know, anybody like that. But at the same time, I guess you know, being the child of it, you're like, just leave my dad alone. Yeah, and I mean, he loved it. He was happy to talk to anyone and sort of explain the special effects or. Talk about the story or um, entertain their their fantasies, and he really loved that. So, um, you know, later on, once I got my appreciation for his films, um, I think that sort of took on a new meaning, and I understood really what everyone was appreciating so much about his work. Is there a film of his that has the most meaning for you? Um, I I really there's there's great material in all of them. I mean, he put so much of his heart and soul into everything he did. So. You know, I can watch Caddyshack and, you know, feel really close to his sort of silly, immature side. Um, I can watch Groundhog Day and, you know, feel comforted by his sort of big picture uh, mentality. Um, I don't have a favorite. I mean, I, I love watching him in Stripes. I love Vacation. Um, Ice Harvest. I mean, Stuart saves his family. It's, They're all great. <laughs> yeah, it's not his movie, but does his performance in uh, Knocked Up? feel particularly close to you because that was you know crafted off of who he was and it, the wisdom of him at of him at that point in his life at that age and he's also playing a father sharing that yeah, wisdom. yeah definitely and I think a lot of that scene was improvised actually um but yes if you want to know what kind of father he was definitely that scene captures his sort of laid back but supportive warm and loving attitude what was that like when you saw that scene for the first time and you saw someone capture your dad I mean, it was great. He sort of warned me beforehand. Um, I had been in a similar knocked up situation a right. few years earlier with my first child. And um, he, he wasn't initially so supportive at that time. So when he, you know, decided to do knocked up, he said, you know, I'm going to do this movie. It might be a little close to home, but, you know, I feel like it's my chance to make it up to you. So that was sweet. What was the most difficult part about writing this book? Um... This right now, no. I <laughs> think <laughs> she's being honest. <laughs> um, it, it really wasn't difficult. I mean, we were just so close, and I really feel like I got so much wonderful material from him in terms of sort of life lessons, um, but also just inspiration to take risks and put yourself out there. Um, and I'd sort of shied away from that, you know, to this point, but I just really felt like it was something that I had to do and that he would have wanted me to do, so... Um, I feel like it was actually pretty painless. Did you want to kind of write the book about your dad before somebody else wrote the book about your dad? No, I mean, I think I felt like I wanted to do it while everything was still fresh. Um, right after he passed away, I, you know, I started to worry about forgetting and sort of losing him um, in losing my memories. So I just started writing every memory down that I could think of, you know, from the time I was very small to all the things he told me about his childhood. Um, I just did not want to forget anything. And I think that's what really pushed me to do it, you know, so soon after. What is your, uh, do you have a best memory or a favorite memory from being on set with him? Um, I mean, he was great you know he was busy obviously so people would sort of you know fill in I spent a lot of time in hair and makeup getting mustaches <laughs> which was fun um but no I mean every movie was like a big adventure to me and so you know going to Jamaica for three months filming Club Paradise was obviously pretty spectacular but being in New York during Ghostbusters was also you know really magical in a different Ghostbusters way. Ghostbusters too you got to meet Bobby Brown right? I did that was like the most exciting thing Which of my life. Like, that's height of Bobby Brown fame is when he did the song for Ghostbusters too. Yeah and he was so young and adorable and um, you know, he was not interested in me at all, but that was like <laughs> <laughs> the most starstruck I ever was, I think. Really? Bobby Brown, the most starstruck you ever were? I mean, you know, he was not in the sort of circle <laughs> that my dad usually hung out with. So, you know, there were a lot of really smart, funny people around throughout my whole life. But 
you know, Bobby Brown was kind of an outlier. Right, like, isn't Bill Murray your godparent? So it's kind of like, yeah, for all of us who are starstruck about (laughs) Bill Murray, I think in the book you say that he would carry you around like a prop all the time, (laughs) right? He did. Yeah, he would just pick you up and sort of swing you around. Um, He would also do that to random women on the street. I mean, (laughs) you know, you... uh, It's weird that we're laughing at that. Like, that's... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you never know what to expect with Bill, and I think that's part of why people are so drawn to him, because he is this mysterious sort of force of nature person, Um, and that's why he and my dad worked so well together, because my dad was very grounded and sort of stuck to the path, and Bill could run around like a maniac. Which is basically what Ivan Reitman told your dad when they were doing, was it Stripes, right? He said something like, Bill's our wild card, you're going to be kind of our our, our uh, train conductor and keep everything yes, on the tracks. Exactly. And then yeah. Ghostbusters too. I mean, I think they d- described, you know, uh, Dan is the heart, my dad is the head, and Bill is the mouth of the Ghostbusters. So, And there's a great story that you tell as well about, uh, just sort of a great example anecdote about the difference between your dad and Bill, which is that they were in some tchotchke shop somewhere, right? Or like a gift shop somewhere? Oh, I think in Bali. In Bali, yeah. yeah. And you sort of reference it as your dad is someone who can't get completely lost all the time. Right, yeah. Bill had um, sort of wandered off and ended up in a very remote village, but just sort of put on a show for the entire village. He was taking people's hats and putting them on and just, you know, grabbing any prop he could and using it. Um, and you know, not my a gift shop, sorry, <laughs> the gift shop, but you know, my dad really admired that and loved that about him because you know, um, he could get lost and, and still be fine where my dad was the one with the map. <laughs> yeah. It's tough when you're the type of person that's the one with the map, when you see someone who doesn't need the map and just goes off, there's always a little bit of jealousy that they, that they have the mental freedom to do that. Yeah. I mean, admiration, jealousy, it's, yeah. you know, hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what, what do you hope readers, uh, take away from most from the book? Um, I mean, I hope that they, you know, sort of feel like they got to know my dad. Um, he, you know, in addition to all the great stuff that he gave us through his films, he just was a genuinely good, uh, warm and, and genuine, generous person. Um, so I hope that people get a sense of that. I mean, he was a seeker. He was really interested in big ideas and, philosophy, psychology, spirituality. Um, he never stopped learning or teaching. And I just feel like even though he was not perfect by any means, he set a great example of sort of how to live a rich and, and sweet life. He, has that, he used that great quote at the end of, uh, I think it's your commencement that he spoke at, right? And um, forgive me, I don't want to dig through the book right now, but it's this wonderful quote that I had never heard before that Upon reading this, I'm, I just know that I'm going to take that quote with me forever, which is live every moment as if you're living it the second time. I'm, mm. I've already kind of forgotten it. Can you, do you yeah, remember exactly I mean, what it I is? I think that is the quote, and now I'm forgetting who it's by. But, yeah, I mean, to just sort of take a moment and, you know, think through the things. Yeah. It doesn't mean you won't ever make mistakes or screw up, but it's about sort of acknowledging and learning and, and always growing. Which is something that I had wished I'd done from like 18 to 28, well, right? Can't. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you can't know until you know. Yeah. When you go back, and, and is there a film of your father's that you return to the most? Um, I mean, I really love Vacation only because really? I'm in it right. <laughs> um, as a child. And I, I think that, you know, I mean, my kids and I, we've watched Ghostbusters many, many times, but Vacation sort of. Um, captures the ridiculousness of, of family life. And for me, at least now, where I am in my life, that's a message that I appreciate. You say that you also uh, recently went back and watched Stuart Saves His Family and said that it, it really holds up and that everybody kind of got it wrong. I think it does. I mean, yeah, at that time, you know, comedies about dysfunctional families were not so much the norm as they are now. And I think, you know, people didn't love the Stuart Smalley character. They didn't have that same affection, you know, widely. I mean, the people who did, did. But I think there are some great performances, and I just think the message of it is really um, sweet and important and I think also, you know, represents to me the way that I think of our family, even though we did not have the issues that their family did. But um, In what way does it <laughs> does it represent... Your family. Um, Well, I just think, you know, you have all these sort of characters together and everyone has their own um, path and and stuff that they're dealing with. But, 
you know, you can get the support that you need and the love that you need from them in really un, 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 in surprising ways. What do you, you know, I, I went, I saw a comedy movie today and I was just like, God, this isn't very good. This is not very funny. And all of your dad's movies, even, you know, if you could say they're, your, they're not your favorite of his, mm -hmm. they are funny. Mm -hmm. They are still, there are still very funny moments within them. If not, the whole thing is very funny. Mm -hmm. What do you think it, it was about your dad that made him such a successful comedy writer and, and director? Because even those of comedy writers and directors with the best of intentions, mm -hmm. it's, very, it's, it's a very hard genre to do right. It is. I mean, I think he got some really great training at Second City. You know, one of their sort of mantras is about, you know, work from the top of your intelligence. And I think even when he was doing sort of the more gross out um, or low comedy, like there was still an intelligence there. He had a, a meaning and a message behind it, even if it wasn't so explicit or apparent. And I think, you know, he brought a lot of thoughtfulness and, um, and intelligence to, to what he did. So, you know, even the broad comedy was not necessarily dumb comedy. Seth Rogen wrote the foreword and tells this really great story. Did you know that story about your dad? Um, I did. I mean, my dad, you know, so enjoyed meeting Seth and, and Judd also. I mean, he sort of thought of them as his, you know, comedy children. Um, and they were always very vocal about, you know, how much they admired him. So, yeah, getting to meet them for the first time and then working with Seth and then getting stoned with Seth. I think, <laughs> you know, he really felt like it was a sort of full circle moment. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Right over Hi. here. Hi. So when you were putting together all the stories you wanted to put in the book, was there anything that might not have meant to you a lot as a child that now as an adult you find a deeper appreciation for? Um, I think that, you know, I, I my parents had a very sort of unconventional relationship and marriage. My mom was not so hands-on when I was a kid. So the fact that my dad really stepped in and was my primary parent throughout my childhood um, I mean, I enjoyed it as a kid, but I don't think I really appreciated, you know, what that meant for, for both of them. Um, and she, she picked the right partner, you know, because he really was that nurturing and warm and loving guy, and it came very naturally to him. No, I have to say, you said that your dad uh, loved talking about himself. And I know you mean that in an incredibly affectionate way. Mm -hmm. uh, I get the sense that you don't love talking about yourself that much. Where do you think, do you, how do you think that ended up that way? Oh, I mean, you know, I had to rebel some way, you know. <laughs> so uh, I didn't go into the family business. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I haven't lived a very public life to now. I mean, he sort of didn't either. I mean, yeah. he he did love talking about himself and his work and he was a director. He did his thing. He was behind the scenes for the he most was, part in the entertainment industry. He used to say he was sort of just the right amount of famous where he could, you know, get a good table at a restaurant, but he wasn't yeah. always being sort of accosted on the street. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm learning. It's did you ever want to go into the family business? No, no, I really didn't. I mean, I just, it seemed you know, like a lot of pressure for something that, you know, is important, but I sort of went in a more socially conscious direction. I think I have time for one more. Hi. Hi. Uh, when you were writing down all the memories of your father, what was the earliest memory that you remember? Um, that's a great question. It, you know, it's hard to tell because so much of what we remember from our childhood is stories that have been told to us over the years. Or, you know, you saw a photograph, so you think you remember it, but you don't actually. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in, in Greece when I was a small child, starting from when I was nine months old. Um, and, you know, I think that I have memories not from nine months old, but from, you know, being three or four. Certainly, I remember I was two on Caddyshack, and I remember the day they did the scene with the explosion. I mean, I was, you know, excited and terrified, and I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it was a big deal. So. <laughs> Violet, I love the book. I think it's a wonderful um, book, but, you know, letter to your dad, and it really shows everybody the kind of person that he was with a big heart and a lot of, and a lot of talent. Thank you for writing it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's on shelves now. People can pick yep, it up. It's on, out everywhere. On shelves or Amazon, all the places audio. that you can get books, audio. Mm -hmm. You can check out the audio book. Everybody, please give a big round of applause for Violet Ramis-Steele and Ghostbusters' dad, daughter. Thank you.